love stories always have a happy beginning. You meet that person, you fall in love. Before long, somebody's popping the question, somebody says yes, and you're standing before a pastor at an altar and you're exchanging vows, and then there's a reception, and then before long, the dress is packed away in a box and the photos are put into a nice album. And it's amazing, the honeymoon. And then, a little while later, there's kids and there's a mortgage. And all these expectations and all these dreams we bring into marriage are amazing. But sometimes, sometimes we come to that point in place in marriage where it's not as easy as it once was. And in this series we began about three weeks ago, we're talking about some of the gods of marriage. We believe that God that we just sang to, that we just worshiped, we believe God created marriage for our pleasure and for our enjoyment. What we also understand is there are some little G gods that we have created that are like idols in our lives. And we expect marriage to be certain things that it wasn't meant to be. And we've talked about things like control, things like selfishness. And we've talked today, we're talking about this idea of expectations. So in this room right now, we have a lot of people who are married. But I also recognize in this room right now, we have a lot of people that are not married. Some of you are teenagers, and one day you hope to be married, and you're like, this message isn't for me. Let me tell you, this is 100% for you to hear this right now. Some of you are young singles, and you hope to be married one day. Some of you have been married, and now you're not, and that's sad, and you've gone through a tough time, and maybe you hope to be married again. Some of you are maybe older and widowed, and, and you say, that part of my life is in the past. I hope that you also, we'll pray for those who are made, but I want you to hear this today. The principles that we're talking about today and that we've been talking about in this series, a lot of them apply to all of our relationships. These are biblical relationship principles for our lives. But today we're talking about expectations. Where do they come from? Why would I come into a marriage with certain expectations of my spouse? Let me tell you the number one resource for our expectations. It's the home that we grew up in, the mom and dad that you had, the marriage that you witnessed, that you lived and breathed 24-7 as a child. That is the biggest source for you of what you expect marriage to be. So if you grew up in a home where mom and dad were very happy and they were in love and, and they had this great model of marriage for you and they were married a long time, you also believe that marriage will be a happy thing and that it will last a long time. But if you grew up in a home where it wasn't so happy, where there was constant fighting, it was very unhealthy, and maybe it ended in divorce, in your mind, as you expect what you expect going into marriage, you think there's a chance that my marriage could end up that same way. Your expectations so often are related to what you saw, what you witnessed growing up. So many married people today have unfulfilled expectations. And unfulfilled expectations are a setup for sadness in any relationship, but especially in marriage. And when you enter marriage with the wrong expectations of your spouse, you'll end up feeling disappointed again and again. And so if we think about the way we've grown up and we understand all the baggage that we have, one of the biggest problems that we need to realize is that we have expectations on our spouse that they have no idea what they are. And some of you have expectations on your spouse and you can't even articulate them. They're not fulfilling everything that you want them to, but you can't even describe exactly what you want them to do. And here's what makes it even more difficult is guess what? They have expectations of you and you don't know what they are. And so this can lead to a lot of frustration and what we're talking about today is a battle that's going on in a lot of our homes between the God of marriage versus the God of expectations. The God who established marriage for our enjoyment that created this idea of marriage versus this God that has become an idol in our lives, this God of expectations. And if they fulfill all of my expectations, then I'll be happy and life will be great. But if they don't, we're going to have problems. And so many of us focus on what the other people 
are supposed to do, the other person. And a lot of times when you enter into a relationship, a friendship or a dating relationship or even marriage, it's like, what does that other person bring to the table? Like, I want to be in this relationship because of what they bring to the table. Like, what is it that they're going to do to make my life better? And that's not a very good perspective. And in fact, when we go into marriage with that perspective, a lot of times we end up with this word, disillusionment. We become disillusioned because I thought it was going to be this way, and it's not this way. I thought they were going to do certain things for me, and they're not doing them. And I don't think anybody goes to the place where they're having their wedding and they're exchanging their vows. And in the moment when they're exchanging vows, they're thinking, man, I really hope this lasts at least five years. (laughs) Or I hope this doesn't fizzle out too fast. Nobody says that or thinks that. But so many marriages, like 50%, end in divorce. And we know that is real. We know that statistic is true. And I will tell you this, no marriage lasts because of a fantasy romance. And I know when you're dating, there's a lot of romance involved in that. That's part of the process. But so many times we bring expectations into our marriage that aren't realistic. And I've seen so many couples. They've gone from saying that they're soulmates to actually living like they're roommates. And marriage is not about having a roommate. That's not what it's about at all. And so if you're a wife and you're thinking because of the way he was when you were dating that you're going to get flowers every single week and that he is going to have this amazing job and you'll never have to work unless you want to and that he's going to come home from these long hours and he's going to want to dive in to playing with the kids and giving them baths and washing the dishes and massaging your feet and all that stuff. You have bought into some fantasy (laughs) that does not exist if you think that that's what it's going to be like. And men, if you think that this woman you're marrying is going to have all of the best qualities of your mom, (laughs) going to cook just like her and take care of you just like her, and all the great qualities of your mom, but none of the annoying qualities of your mom. (laughs) Not that my mom has any annoying qualities. She's here. Um, (laughs) You know what I'm saying? It's like, that's not going to happen. This is not going to happen. And we will end up disillusioned by something that wasn't meant to be mean or hurtful. I'll tell you something. I don't think your spouse is evil. You should never think that they're evil or they're just being so selfish. Some of it is they have no idea what your expectations are. And when you're young and you're first married early on in the marriage, a lot of times just getting used to each other. And if you think back to a lot of your fights when you're young, your arguments when you're first married, it's over stuff that's not that big of a deal. I mean, we, I don't even remember many of ours, but I mean, a lot of them were insignificant about ways to do certain things in the house, all right? About how to cook certain meals. Like, that's not the way you make spaghetti. Why are you, why are you doing it like that? Or, you know, that's not the way you fold laundry. You know, and little things that you could fight about that really aren't significant. And sometimes I think silly stuff builds up to bigger stuff. And when you talk to people who are professional counselors that work with people that are struggling in their marriage, Almost always there's some unmet expectations, and a lot of them aren't realistic. Not every expectation is wrong, but a lot of them are built on the spirit of pride and the spirit of our own self-thought of what we think it should be. And there's a common phrase that begins a lot of these expectations, and it's just three words, and the words are, but I thought. (laughs) And marriage counselors say they hear it all the time, but I thought. This is what they were going to do, or this is how it was going to be. I'm going to give you five of them, five of the most common but I thought statements that people have. It's not funny yet. Don't laugh. (laughs) But I thought marriage would make me happy. You ever heard that? You ever thought that? As a single person, I feel like there's something missing in my life, and I think if I get married, that will make me happy. I thought marriage is all about making me happy, so I find the perfect spouse, and that I heap all of the weights on them that their purpose in life is now to make me happy. That is a ton of pressure on that person. And I will tell you something, that is not what God designed marriage for, for that person to just make your life happy. In fact, we're going to talk more about happiness next week. That can be a God in our lives. 
but there's no spouse that's perfect and no person should ever be the single source of your happiness. But I thought my spouse would meet all of my needs. (laughs) Wow, that can ruin a marriage when you focus on your needs. It's all about you meeting my needs. I thought that would happen. Last week, Mitch did a great job talking about Ephesians 5 and the roles of husbands and wives in marriage and how we're supposed to submit to one another and how there's some leadership, leadership aspects there and there's some honoring that needs to take place with each other and how we meet each other's needs and how it talks about that. But our command is not to focus on them meeting our needs, but us meeting their needs. But I thought, but I thought, this is a good one, I thought he or she would change after we got married. Oh, marrying somebody with the expectation of once I have them in my house, I'm going to fix everything that their mom did to them or their dad or whatever has messed them up. You know, I'm going to fix all those bad behaviors, all those selfish things that they do, their messiness, all of that. I'm going to change them. Marriage is not a magic change engine agent. It does not transform somebody into this new amazing person. The person that you're dating is going to be the person that you marry. And you have to understand your job is not to change them, but you should marry someone that you trust right now. Not marry them for their potential. (laughs) Look at what they are right now. Yes, they may change and hopefully we do change and we do get better. But thinking that we can change somebody, our job is not to change them but to love them and understand them. But I thought if I found the right one, marriage would be easy. (laughs) Good marriages take effort. It's work. I don't care who you are. You got to understand that person. You got to love them. You got to honor them. And a person who is passionate about a strong marriage thinks about their spouse often and invests in that relationship. It's never easy. And along with that one, number five, but I thought good marriages never struggle. You know, that's a misconception a lot of people have. Oh, you have a really good marriage. It's so easy for you. You guys don't struggle. That is not true. I haven't talked to anybody that's been married for any length of time that hasn't been able to tell a story of a struggle in their marriage. Every marriage struggles. I think every marriage hits a wall at some point. You're going along and everything's great, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, there's this difficulty, this trial, and you're like, what is going on? We have seasons like that in marriage. Now, you got to recognize that every difficulty can be worked through with the grace of God, with biblical truth. If you're willing to both work together to strengthen the relationship, you'll get through it. You'll be stronger for it. But when you start hearing yourself saying those three words, but I thought, that's a sign in your life that maybe you have some unrealistic expectations for this relationship. And so, in our flesh, we, we hear this in our mind, that the only way that my unfulfilled expectations can be overcome is if my spouse changes and fulfills all of my dreams. I got a word for you today. That ain't happening. Your spouse is not going to fulfill every one of your dreams. Oh, they might for a moment. There might be great days like that. But that is not the role that God has for them in your life. And the Bible tells us there's another way. So what I want to do is spend the rest of the time looking into God's Word and talking about this. How do we destroy this God of expectations, this idol that creeps into our marriages? Let me again say this. It creeps into all of our relationships. Some of you have some great friendships, and the friendships struggle because of unfair expectations you put on that other person. So there's a lot of application in these biblical principles, not just for our marriages, but for all of our relationships. But how do we keep expectations from being a God in our lives? Five things. Number one, trade expectations for appreciation. This is a simple one. This is obvious, but sometimes we don't get it. We need to learn this. When we have an expectation on someone, it's usually a negative context in our head. Like it's a negative thought about that person. They're not doing something that I want them to do for me. And I'm thinking negative thoughts about them. If we will stop ourselves when we're doing that and instead look at the good qualities in that person and find something in them to appreciate and speak those words of appreciation, 
that will absolutely transform our marriages. It will absolutely help us to defeat the God of expectations. It'll take you so much further. The Apostle Paul talked about this in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3. He said, don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Hear this part. He said, be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Be humble. Think of your spouse as better than you. Don't look out just for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. Sure, they might not fold towels correctly. They might not make spaghetti right. They might not be doing their fair share of the work around the house. They, they, they should have taken the dog for a walk and you had to do it again. But if you pay attention, there is something to appreciate in your spouse. Let me ask you, what was it that attracted you to them in the first place? Was it their ability to fold laundry? <laughs> I doubt it. Was it their ability to make spaghetti the right way? No, that's not what attracted you to them. It was their warmth. It was their kindness. It was their love for life and their love for you. Go back to that. And this applies to all of our relationships. Think about what it is that you appreciate in that person. And instead of being negative about your expectations they're not meeting, think about something you can compliment and appreciate about them. Here's number two. Embrace the long-term commitment. Embrace that marriage is a long-term commitment. I'm so thankful for the examples in my life. Uh, both sets of my grandparents on both sides were married over 60 years. And my parents are here today. They're, they're in their 55th year of marriage. My wife and I are in our 33rd year of marriage. I am thankful for that. I'm thankful for those examples. It's not a short-term venture. I'm in it for life. This is a lifetime commitment, and I'm going to make this work over the long haul. So what am I saying? If we're going to defeat this God of expectations, we have to have the mentality of, I'm in this, I'm not getting out of this, and I'm going to figure this out, I'm going to work at it, and I'm going to embrace that. My wife and I have always been forward thinkers, so when we first got married, we you know, thought about what's coming next. And we had, you know, after about three years, we had our first child. We were thinking about that. We're thinking about getting our first house. We're always talking about what's next. In our lives, right, what's next right now is we have a, a freshman in high school and three grandchildren and one more coming any day now. And we're thinking about that and we're enjoying this phase of our life. And yes, we do talk about, okay, what's down the road in 10 years? What's that going to look like? What we don't want to be is the couple that gets old and all we talk about is what hurts on our bodies. You know, like old people sometimes, we talk too much about everything hurting. Like I was talking to somebody in their 20s the other day, it's like, do you remember the last day where everything just felt good? I'm like, no. I mean, you're in your 20s. I'm older. And I don't remember, you know, a day where like, man, you know, wake up and just everything feels good all day long, right? I don't want to be, we don't want to be that couple as we get older that that's what we focus on all the time. I mean, we talk about a lot of things and dreaming about our future. And one of the things that is awesome is when we keep that in our view, that we're together for the long haul. And one of the things you should never do when you're having a, an argument or a fight in your relationship is question the nature of your relationship. In other words, they're not meeting your expectations and you're angry and you're like, I don't know if this is going to last. Don't ever say that. I don't know if you're really in this. Don't make accusations like that. When you say things like that, when you question it, whether the relationship's going to survive, what you're doing is corroding trust in the relationship. And that takes a toll even on the strongest of marriages. I love what Jesus said in Mark chapter 10 about marriage. He said, this explains why a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united in the one. Since they are no longer two but one, let no one split apart what God has joined together. There's some beauty in this idea of oneness, right? We're created to be connected to other people. And we're created for this idea of having a close relationship. And this idea of marriage that Jesus talked about goes back to Genesis. It goes back to the beginning. In Genesis chapter 2, where Adam you know, took a little nap and God took a rib out and he created a woman. And Adam woke up and saw her and said, Wow! This is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. Two became one. It's amazing. 
It doesn't work for math. One plus one equals one. But that's what marriage is all about. And it's a beautiful thing. And you know what? Some of you think what I want to have is my spouse change and improve and adjust to me. I'm going to tell you what you need and what I need. A lot of times we need an attitude adjustment. You're like, well, that's what my kids need. I know, but so do we. As adults, sometimes like, I don't want to. I don't want to work on this. I don't want to do what she wants. I don't want to change. I don't want to be with them. And sometimes it's all about our attitude. So instead of a new, improved spouse, what if we had a new, improved attitude? Can, I help, can you help me for a minute to remember the vows that, you know, you made in marriage? Just like maybe fill in the blank out loud for me here. We said that we were making a commitment to each other that was for better or for, right, for richer or for, in health and in, as long as we both shall live. So that means if I kill him, I can get out of it. <laughs> I've heard women ask that question before. No, it doesn't work that way. But the truth is, it's a commitment. Embrace it. Embrace it. Embrace compassion for that person. If you're going to successfully navigate any relationship, you got to prioritize love over expectations. When was the last time you just said, God, thank you for providing me a spouse? Thank you for providing me this relationship, this friend. What are you going to do to grow that relationship? Why do we expect our marriage and our marriage partner to meet all of our expectations, but yet we're not investing ourselves in it? We're talking about defeating the God of expectations. Here's number three. Number three, initiate a serving competition. I wasn't sure I wanted to use that word competition, but I know it speaks to a lot of you because a lot of you are very competitive people. And so this idea of starting, this idea of I'm just going to outserve them. Selfishness kills relationships. Serving always wins. Serving others is a sign of spiritual maturity in our lives. Paul said, I'm going to look at two verses from Romans. In Romans 12, 10, he said, love each other with genuine affection. Take the light in honoring each other. And then in another paraphrase, he says, outdo one another by showing honor. Outdo each other. Showing honor, what does that mean? It means we say things that honor them. It means we do things that honor them. It means we serve them. And a lot of us struggle with this deep down. You know why? Because we're selfish. There's something in us that hangs back. Maybe my spouse will, you know, walk the dog, change the diaper, put the kids to bed, empty the dishwasher. If, you know, sometimes Steve sits on the couch and hopes that my wife doesn't know where I am or <laughs> pretends, Steve pretends like he doesn't hear her because he doesn't want to do something that maybe she's asking him to do. You know what that is? Selfishness. Some of you think, that's really smart. No, <laughs> it's wrong. It's really wrong. But sometimes there's a part in me that's like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to serve. I don't want to do what she wants me to do sometimes. But in the last 24 hours, if you had to make a list of all the opportunities you missed to serve your spouse, how long would that list be? You say, well, how long do I have to do it? If the scoreboard says that I'm winning, I've served her 20 times and she's only served me 10, don't I need to wait, let her catch up? No, no, that's not it. In Romans 13, Paul said, pay all of your debts except the debt of love to others, and you can never finish paying that. You never finish. Healthy relationships hinge on being considerate of each other. And sometimes, here's what we do. Um, we value relationship rules over the relationship. Relationship rules, we all have them. Whether you have them written, I hope you don't have them written, but whether you have them spoken about in your marriage, in any relationship, there's some rules that you follow. And I know some couples are like, okay, here's the rules. Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday are your nights to make dinner and do the dishes. Monday, Wednesday, Friday are my days. Okay, cool. You have an agreement. That's a rule. You know, you have other things like that. Maybe in one night, you know, it's supposed to be their night, but they're not feeling well. So you say, you know what? I got it. I know it's your night. I got it. Because I value the relationship. Bless you. And if you value the relationship over the rules, that doesn't mean that you say, no, because I did that for you, you owe me the next two nights. <laughs> That's not it. That's not it. It's like, it might not end up being fair. Exactly. 
You're trying to outdo them in serving. You're trying to outserve them. It's not about it being even. It's not about rules. You, gotta, you really got to study your spouse. You got to know them. I mean, men and women are different, right? I mean, we know that. But your spouse is unique. You need to get to know them and know what their needs are, what really helps make them tick. And we forget that. There was a book, a pretty well-known book that came out years ago called His Needs, Her Needs, talking about marriage and understanding the difference between men and women. How many of you are familiar with that book? Um, two. Okay, cool. So I'll tell you about it. Um, um, they, they kind of generalize men and women, but they identify the top five needs of men and top five needs of women. And they're different. Men and women are different. And you might be thinking you're doing something to meet their needs and you're doing something that you want, but not really what they want. So for women, they identify the top five needs. Number one is affection. And for husbands, that doesn't mean groping, okay? Affection. Number two, um, conversation. Number three, honesty. Number four, financial support. Number five, family commitment. They need to see that you're committed to the family. And then when it got to men, the top five needs were, number one, sex. Number two, oxygen. Number three, sports. Number four, food. And number five, remote controls. You see how deep men are? <laughs> um, that's not true. That, I made that. That's not the actual list. But some of you are like, that's pretty accurate. That's my husband right now. So you know um, where that list came from. Anyway, the actual list in the book was actually sex was number one. But then recreational companionship was two, um, somebody to do something with. Number three is an attractive spouse, someone that takes care of themselves and looks as best they can. Number four, support at home. Number five is admiration. I don't want to meet his needs until he meets my needs, right? What about my rights? I expect him to do this for me if I do that for him. Jesus never said anything about rights, did he? He didn't say our spouse's must fulfill all of our expectations. He said we're to love and we're to serve and we're to honor no matter what. We're talking about defeating a false God, the God of expectations. Here's number four. Shatter your routines. We all have routines. And one of the most common answers uh, we give and we get when we ask people, how you doing? How's your family? Oh, we're just so busy. <laughs> busy, busy, busy. And that's true, right? I mean, a lot of us are very busy. And busyness in marriage and family life can lead to routines and they can lead to ruts and that can lead to boredom. And boredom can be very dangerous in your marriage. This past week was Valentine's Day, right? How many of you went out some point for Valentine's Day? You went out some point. Much better than the first service. Like nobody went on a date. Um, when you go out on a date and you're married, maybe you're out on Valentine's Day at a restaurant and they say, this is what people say. You look around and you can tell which couple's are married and which ones are dating because the dating couples are really happy <laughs> and they're looking at each other and they're laughing and they're having conversation and the married couples look miserable and they're on their phones the whole time. That's so sad. One of my favorite things to do with my wife is to go out to dinner together, just the two of us, and just to talk and communicate and, and just share life together and, you know, try to, I try to make her laugh and sometimes I'm funny and she likes that, you know. And that's part of our relationship. We should not be bored, but sometimes that happens. It sets in in marriage. Solomon said this. He was struggling. Solomon was trying to figure out his purpose in life and whether life had meaning. But he did say this. This is good. Ecclesiastes 9. He said, live happily with the woman you love through all the meaningless days of life that God has given you under the sun. He's like, life is just going by, but be happy that you're married. The wife God gave you is a reward for all your earthly toil. Your spouse is a gift from God. Enjoy them. Have fun. One of the reasons marriages fail is because of boredom. Don't become stagnant in your marriage. Are you fun to live with? Are you the same old thing day after day? I get home and I'm tired and I can't wait to get to my recliner and stuff food in my mouth and put the TV on and fall asleep snoring. In a, that's really fun. I'm sure she loves that, or maybe he, you know, she does that, I don't know. Sounds like a man thing to me, but the truth is, we can get boring. We can become that boring person, and we weren't boring when we fell in love and when we were dating and we were younger. Do something new. Maybe stop 
watching TV and play a game or do a puzzle or go to a movie theater, go out to dinner, um, you know, start holding hands again. You know, maybe offer to do something shocking like let me do the carpool. Whoa, let me put the kids to bed. And when your spouse suggests something new and they expect you to say no, guess what? Say yes. Yeah, I'll do that. They're going to be shocked. They're going to be like, why are you saying yes? You say, because Steve said so, and I'm, I know I'm supposed to shatter routines, and whatever it takes. But here's a scary sequence for a lot of couples. It goes from romance, and then it becomes a routine, and then you become just roommates. And you can find roommates, but that's not what marriage is supposed to be. And I know it can't always be at the same level of romance that it was, maybe when you were falling in love and dating, and I, I know things change, and there's time crunches on our lives, and all that, but we have to be careful not to become boring. If your marriage isn't growing, maybe it's just maintaining or maybe it's declining, but you have to decide to move from focusing on your expectations not being met, and instead of that, focusing on shattering the expectations of your spouse, and watch what that does for your marriage. Here's number five. To defeat the God of expectations, number five, prioritize the God of marriage. To defeat the God of expectations, prioritize the God of marriage. This is just foundational and it makes absolute sense. I know you know this, but I'm going to say something. The God of marriage wants to be the God of your marriage. The God of marriage, the God who created marriage, wants to be the God of your marriage. And don't sit there and say, well, yeah, obviously, I mean, we're both Christian, my, my spouse and I, so yeah, it's true. No, it's not necessarily true just because you're both Christian. To so we're in church together, great, that is a good step. But just because you're both believing in God doesn't necessarily mean that God is the God of your marriage. Picture it this way, you're over here and your spouse is over here and God's up here. And you want to get closer to your spouse. But what can happen in your marriage is if you, know, you start getting closer to God and they start getting closer to God and you get closer to God and they get closer to God. As you're getting closer to God, what's happening? You're getting closer to each other. And you're connecting better with one another. If I choose with all my heart to be a, a man of God that pursues God, and my wife chooses to be a woman of God and is pursuing God, that's going to make our relationship with each other better. 1 John 1, 7, John said, If we're living in the light of God's presence, then we have wonderful fellowship and joy with each other. We both have to be pursuing God. If I'm pursuing God and Sherry's pursuing God, we're going to have a beautiful thing. From a practical standpoint, how does this work? How does focusing on our relationship with God make us a better partner in marriage? How does it make us a better friend in any relationship, focusing on our relationship with God? When you become a believer, hear me on this, when you become a believer in Jesus, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. And every day as a believer, what we should be doing is praying and asking the Holy Spirit to fill us and to guide us and to work in us. And the Bible's clear. If we're connected to the Father and the Holy Spirit is working in us, it's going to produce something in our lives that the Bible calls fruit. Just like a tree produces fruit, we as believers will produce fruit in our lives. And really, the fruit are just characteristics that we should have as followers of Christ. You say, what are they? Well, there's nine of them listed in Galatians, nine of them. It says the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Do these qualities exist in your marriage? Look at that list. Would that list, would those qualities make you have a better marriage? Would they make you a better spouse? Would they make you a better friend? And the answer is obviously yes. So what we need to do is look at that list and show that verse to our spouse and say, these are my expectations of you. If you will be all these nine things, you will love me better and my life will be so much better. So here's the verse, step it up. Maybe, just maybe, and this is the way I want to end today, is we need to look in the mirror at ourselves. And all these expectations that become at the forefront of our minds that are there, that we're focused on what they're not doing for us. Instead, we say, I want to be more connected to God 
I want to produce this list of nine fruit in my life. And I'm going to raise the level of expectation, not on my spouse, but I'm going to raise the level of expectation on me. I'm not going to raise the level of expectation on my friends. I'm going to raise the level of expectation on me because I need to be producing this fruit, the fruit of the Spirit in my life. I believe that the world conditions us to expect. The glossy advertising, the consumer-driven marketing all over the place, whether it's TV or social media, they're all saying the same thing. You deserve more. You deserve everything that you want and expect in life. Let us give it to you. And I'll tell you, the world will constantly disappoint you. There may be thrills in a moment, but sometimes that idea transfers over to our relationships and our marriages. And we expect every moment to be this high moment and every day to be amazing because of what they do, that what my spouse does to fulfill every dream that I have. If you want to transform your marriage, leave your selfish expectations at the cross and pick up the only Christ-like expectation. And that is that you decide more than anything, I'm going to serve my spouse and I'm going to serve the true God of marriage. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity to look into your word at some great principles, God, about how we should treat our spouses, how we should treat our closest friends, what we should expect in a relationship, and what we should expect of ourselves. So God, there's conviction. God, there's, there's so much that we need to do to be, to be the person that we need to be. It's not about them. It's about us transforming. It's about us becoming more like Jesus. And God, I pray that you would help us each to do some introspection and evaluation. And God, work in our hearts, work in our lives. God, I pray for anybody here that maybe is struggling in their relationship with you. God, I pray that you would encourage them to talk to someone about that before they leave today. Thank you, God, for being with us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray.